What's the biggest mismatch you have ever refed? You know, you could go back all the way. There was two. If you want to talk about, you know, all the way in the past, I'll give you ones in the past and I'll give you something in the present. Who's the dodgiest fight you've ever had to deal with? One of those guys, he's just a junkyard dog. He will do anything to win the fight. He will, he will he'll cover himself in onion juice and stink. He'll, he's just horrible. Uh, what was the hardest fight for you to ever oversee? One of the most di more difficult fights is a fight that everyone loved. And that would have been Robbie Lawler against Rory McDonald, oh. number two. It was at yeah. UFC 189. But you know, he was aspirating blood throughout that fight, meaning because his nose got damaged early in the fight. Yeah. And he couldn't breathe out of his nose. And so he's, and he's, every time he's, you get little droplets because he's getting cuts inside of his mouth, they're starting to flow into his lungs. And you can see him starting to do well at the beginning of the round and then fall off towards the end because his body is giving out based upon the lack of oxygen. What made you go from, from refereeing to commentating? I am really excited today for today's guest here on the Human Podcast, none other than the legendary Big John McCarthy. John, how are you, sir? I'm good, Marcus. How are you doing? Good seeing you, man. Likewise, man. It's been a minute. Uh, it has been. It's been it's been a minute since I've seen anyone really We're trying to do the right thing over here. But uh, you you you're not in LA right at the moment. No, I'm right in the moment. I'm in. Uh, Connecticut. I'm at the Mohegan Sun in Uncasville, Connecticut for a, a Bellator show tomorrow night. And this, this, you're now commentating. We're going to talk about that in a bit. You're transitioning from, from refing to, to commentating. What's it like to commentate in a completely, almost completely empty stadium? You know, it's, it's to commentate, you have to be cognizant of the fact the fighters can hear you. Right, and so right. you, you want to be able to express, you know, what you believe the fighters are doing well and what someone needs to do to kind of change what's going on. But you also don't want to be coaching and giving information off to someone. So that's, that, that's for their coach to do because maybe you're saying the wrong thing. Right. You know? right. <laughs> so you, we, we try to tone it down. It's kind of funny we were talking about that because I work with Goldberg and Goldberg's very loud. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. when you've got an audience, you know, you can't tell. But when you don't, you, it's like – you can hear everything that he's saying at all times. And we're sitting kind of at the distance apart for all the, you know, social distancing and everything. So it, it's a little bit different, but it's all the same. It's fights and it's, it's, it's definitely not rocket science. Right. right. Well, it's certain science to it. And, and no one knows about that development of science more than you. You've been there since day one, you know, and I, I have to say we've had some, really big names on, on this show and, and some really exciting, you know, backgrounds on those people. I have never had as many people reach out with as many questions for anyone. The, the, the amount of questions that I've had today leading up to this, I don't even know if I'll get through all the questions. That means I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say not a single bad question wow. um, and, and nothing like nothing, you know, you know, over, You've been refing for, is it, I don't want to make sure my math is correct, 24 years, 26 years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, at, right at 25 years. 25, okay. A uh, long so, time. you know, and a career. Long, yeah, it is, it's a long career. It is a career. Do, do you know how many fights you've refed? Do you have any idea? You know, it's impossible. I can tell you about how many like UFC fights, because mm -hmm. that's really what people went on. And that would be, you know, I saw somewhere where they said 796. I said, no, that's wrong. But it's okay because, you know, there's, there's times you know, they try to go back. And if you look at the record keeper, there's many times, you know, I did a fight and it'll, you know, say referee, not available because they, they don't remember. And that's fine. Who cares? Like, it's, it's the referee. So I would tell you that overall in my career, I'm in the, I'm in the, the high thousands if you're looking towards eight, nine, maybe into 10,000 fights total. I couldn't tell you the total because – in the, you know, near the end of my career, you got to figure I was doing about 105 to 115 shows right, right. a year. So that's, you know, you're figuring that's more than two a week for the year. And there were certain weeks that, you know, we didn't do, you know, we never really did shows on Thanksgiving weekend and we didn't do shows on Christmas weekend. We would do it on, I would do them on, New, you know, New Year's. Yeah, yeah. But you know, sometimes I would do a show in Las Vegas on a Tuesday that was an ultimate fighter or a 
you know, Dana White contender series or something like that. And then on Thursday, I'd be doing a show in Orange County. And on Friday, I'd be doing a show, you know, somewhere that was far away. And then Saturday. So I was doing sometimes four shows a week. That's a lot of fights. And a lot of people don't realize, like, you know, they see you on TV in, you know, when you're referring in the UFC or, you know, Bellator, wherever the, the, the fights were at. But they, a lot of times, didn't see the smaller shows. When you would do, you know, King of the Cage or Respect yeah. in the Cage back in the days and, you know, all the, all, <laughs> all the, the smaller TFA and, and everywhere else where we, we fall coming up in California. You dedicated your life to this. Yeah, I thought it was very important. You know, a lot of people had this. It was it was part of the reason I kind of you know I went away for a while because I needed to get away and have control of what I was doing in the sport yeah. and who I was doing it for. So you know, my whole thing was I thought it was just as important for young fighters to have the proper education as far as rules and regulations and what's going on, and to have someone there that brought them, you know, a sense of stability as they're coming up in their career. Because, you know, for every fighter, every fight is the most important fight you have, you know, and, and so it's, it is important. And I always treated it like it was important. And I thought it was very important for me to do what I call grassroots show, the smaller shows, yeah. because that allowed me to see the guys that were going to be coming up in the future. And so, you know, I got to see guys like you. I got to see guys like Brian Ortega because I ref those guys in their very first professional fight. And you got to see their progression and you knew who was the, who were the guys that were going to make it to that level, you know, and, and, you know, even traveling abroad, you know, I traveled to Russia all the time and I saw guys over there that, you know, they may never be known by an American crowd. They may never make it to the UFC, but they're not, not making it because of their skill level. They're not making it based upon, well, they don't speak the language of English and, you know, they're just not as marketable as this guy over here because there's a lot that goes into the promotion of fighting and it's a business, but there are guys out there all around the world that are so good. Yeah. You know? yeah. And it was, it was really fun being able to see those guys as they progressed in their careers where they were fighting. And, and I've seen it with you. I've seen, I've seen fighters coming in and being starstruck with the referee, which is, which is kind of funny to see. You know, you're, you're there to regulate and make sure that you're, you're the first responder. You're the first line of, of defense when the, def when the fighter can't defend themselves anymore. And, and, and they are more excited about, about seeing you than, than the fight that are about, they're about to be in, which, yeah. is, which, is, which is funny. When, but at the same time, you know, you truly are a pioneer in this. I, I got to ask you, I, I have so many questions from, from listeners and people that have written, but I also have a bunch of questions myself that I've never actually had a chance to, to ask you. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this. But what was it? How did John, big John McCarthy end up in the UFC octagon in the first place? Oh, my God. I, I, you know, I was a student of Horian Gracie. Mm. I met Horian Gracie uh, after the – I was working for the LAPD, and there was the Rodney King incident. And then the, the LAPD put together this group that they called the Martial Arts Review Panel to look at what was being implemented by the police to subdue a person that was either fighting or just, you know, noncompliant and all those different things. And I met Horry and Gracie through that right after that incident. And I started training with him. I, I went to us, you know, went to, you know, go roll with him and I rolled with Hoist and he arm barred me and I fell in love with what they did. And so that was how I started. And then I was with them for, you know, a couple of years there. And then this ultimate fighting championship things came around. And then I was Hoist's sparring partner for it. And the very first UFC, yeah, the very first fight is how I got my job. Yeah, because the very first fight was Taylor Tule versus Gerard Gordo, and they had brought in a referee, you know, two of them from Brazil. One was Jao Bejeto, and he was a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu under Elio Gracie, and you know, good guy. And he, you have to understand, back then there were no rules. Basically, there was three rules: you know, no biting, no eye gouging, and no groin shots. And the referee did not truly have the power to stop the fight. He wasn't supposed to stop the fight. The fighter was supposed to tap out or the corner was supposed to throw in the towel. That was the way for the fight to stop. Now, that's not a smart way of going about it, but that's what 
they did at the time. And if you watch the first fight, you know, Taylor goes out and he ends up, you know, falling down and he gets kicked in the face and punched. And, you know, tooth goes flying out and he gets a cut and Jabba Heto stops it and says, hey, this guy can't fight. And Jorge and Gracie comes over to the side and they're arguing in Portuguese about, hey, you're not supposed to stop the fight. He didn't tap out. And he's saying, this guy can't fight. So at that moment, Jorge and, you know, called me over and said, I need you to referee. And, and I, told, I told him, I don't know how to referee. And I didn't, you know, and he said, he goes, no, no, you'll be great at it. He goes, you know, more than, you know, these guys are, you know, what they're doing and what they should be doing. And you don't mind seeing people get hurt. That was my qualification. So not quite true, but that's how I got the job. And um, that was actually one of the questions from, from one, one of our amateur fighters here who said, how do you become a referee? I want to become a referee. I said, what you've got to do is go and look at, at John's website. You, you, you have, it's even on his Wikipedia page, it says how to become a, a ref. And you did start a really good ref school. I know some of our guys here from Systems been over there and you used them as, as fighters during the course. Um, and, and, and it's easy to say that you're going to stay true to what you do. You truly have stayed true to what you do as far as being like you give, dedicated your weekends for many, many years to this. Like you said, the grassroots of mixed martial arts and creating a really, really good referee course. How did you get that going? You know, I got that going based upon there was, you know, the, the sport was starting to grow. And there was, when, as soon as athletic commissions really started to come into play, you know, all they had were boxing officials. Right. And right. so they, they did one of two things. They, you know, they had a boxing official who says, I can, I can referee that. Mm. being MMA, or they took someone that had, oh, my friends got a black belt in Shotokan Karate. And we had a lot of problems with what referees were doing because they just didn't understand this style of fighting. So mm. I went and I said, look, I've got a, I've made a lot of mistakes. I knew I had made a lot of mistakes, but I, I always in every show that I ever did, I would look and say, what did I do? Should that have, you know, should I have done that different? If I, if I should have done it different, okay, what should I do? How do I fix it? Now let me move on. Well, that was years of experience that I figured, well, if I put on a course, then people can get that experience and get past some of the things that I had made a mistake in and what was expected early on in fights and what we were doing now. So that was the whole purpose for the course. We had a, I had a lot of athletic commissions asking for training. So that's why I put the course together. And then it became, it became a battle because my whole thing was I'm always there. I think of fighter first. Yeah. And I look and said, well, you know, if I'm going to, you know, you want me to pass these people, I'm not going to just pass people. They yeah. have to know what they're doing. And so, you know, I, in the beginning I said, okay, I have a 90% that you have to get on every test that I give you. And then when I started, it was three tests. Now it's up to seven tests, you know, and it's a 90%. You get 89 on one of those. I will fail you yeah. because I look at it and say, Hey, do you want the guy who, who came in with, you know, a D D level and is your doctor and he's going to be cutting you open? Or do you want the guy that, you know, just barely made it through flight school? No, you want the guy that's the best because that's the one that's going to give you the best opportunity to be successful in this fight. So I, I ran into a lot of opposition because of that. I had a lot of people saying that, you know, I wasn't being fair, that I was, you know, I was trying to keep people from, you know, competing with me. And it's like, you have no idea. You know, I, I don't care about that. And I, you know, I've proven that over the years because I've brought so many people in and pushed so many people to, ahead of me to try to get them work. You know, my whole thing is, the best people should be doing the job. Whether you like them or you hate them does not matter. Who is best for that job? And that's the person that should be in there. And I can tell you uh, from both my own perspective, but several of those fighters that went to the course and were the dummies inside of the cage when you, when you had them, they were both surprised and very, very happy that you were that hard on them. And the way you talk to the referees and make them understand that, the responsibility that they carry on their shoulders. So that's as 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 a fighter, thank you for taking that job very seriously and 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 developing great in, in coaches. You know, from from you, Jason, uh, Herb. You know, it, you guys have have done 
it, it shows. You know when you, you know when you have a ref when you go in there, whether it's was myself or one of our guys, and you go, oh great, he's gonna ref this fight. Versus sometimes it's been like, oh crap, this guy is gonna be in there. Look out for this. Look out for that. Make sure you don't do this because he won't notice it. You like it's gotten a lot better over the years. But yep. in the early years, you, you're right. It was a little bit of a cowboy thing, right? Oh, it was a crapshoot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I got a, um, I, I got a, a really interesting question. Since you've been there since day one, if you could take the first generation of fighters to today's fighters and, and, and ma- match one of the champions from the early on with one of the later champions, one of today's champions, what's a matchup that you would like to have seen or would like to, to be able to, to, to play if they were at, you know, at the peak at the same time? <clears throat> well, I have to ask you a question on that. Is that a young champion of today or a person that's older, still fighting, and, and was a champion but isn't a champion of today? I would have to, it was, that one, this isn't my question. This is one of the okay. listeners' questions. And so we'll say uh, a champion of today. Champion of today, someone who's in their prime uh, and against someone when they were there in their prime. Well, that would be it. It would be so tough because I, I'm just being honest. You know, the sport has changed so much. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I like the guys of the past. I like the old guys, but you have to be honest and say, they were it's like computers yeah. they were the they were the early microsoft or apples you know and if you take that computer of back then and you put it against the computers of today they don't match up very well now that doesn't mean that they were not tough and it doesn't mean that they were not skilled at what they did mm-hmm. but having the complete skill sets that you see from so many fighters of today Man, it would be very tough to take anybody that, you know, is fighting. I know, you know, Chuck Liddell, when Chuck Liddell was, you know, a young fighter, man, he had a granite chin. Yeah. He was very good at sprawl and brawl. Yeah. You could take and say, you know, put him against a John Jones of today. Yeah. You know, would he have a chance? Yeah, he'd have a puncher's chance. Yeah. yeah. But – do I think he would do well? No, not that the Chuck, even when he was who he was back then, he's just not as, you know, complete a fighter as what we see today. And so I don't want, I don't want any of my older guys getting beat up by the young guys. <laughs> yeah. That was a great Microsoft Apple metaphor is the best metaphor I've ever heard because you're right, right? You look at boxing, you have, you have six strikes you can do different ways with them, but straight punches, hooks and uppercuts. And you can say a fighter of the 50s versus a fighter of today, but we are just entering the first true generation of hybrid fighters, right? Versus in the early days, you either were a wrestler and then got into mixed martial arts or a boxer. Got in. So you couldn't make up for those years that you missed in wrestling or in jiu-jitsu the way you can today. And I know I'm jumping all over the place here with the questions, oh, but there's so many that are so good and you mentioned Horian, and, and last week me and Shane had uh, Henner on, and we talked about you know what's been happening with law enforcement. I can't help but go back to that since you have a background in law enforcement, you are a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like many many people might not know that, but and, and and on top of it, you know you you you've been around fighting for for so long. Um, What's your opinion on police brutality or the use of force for police officers and what's being displayed right now? Well, when I used to teach police officers, it was, I I told them all the time, you know, you're expected to be this professional in so many areas. You're, You're expected to be this person that, you know, human relations wise can talk to people psychology wise, you can talk people off the ledge, you know, law wise, you have the the knowledge of a lawyer. And then they expect you also to be this person that in a fight, you're going to win. Yeah. You know, and if you believe that the training that you got in this academy is enough for that to happen, you need to quit right now and you're fooling yourself and you're putting yourself in a position where 
eventually somewhere along the, the line, you're going to run into that person that's not going to comply, not going to go along with the program, and you're going to be in trouble. So if you want to be a professional, then you need to, ha- you need to go somewhere, spend money. It's like paying for insurance and learn how to actually handle yourself in a hand-to-hand combat situation or a situation where someone doesn't want to comply, but they want to resist. And how do you make that resistance work for you so you, you make it look easy instead of trying to work against it and now you look like a fool? Mm-hmm. And you know that was always dependent upon that individual officer. I tried to shove them towards you've got to train. You've got to, the more that you work at being good at something, everything in the law enforcement field is a perishable skill. Your shooting skills, your hand-to-hand combat skills. If you don't train, you're falling behind. And you could see, you know, in some of the things that happen, you know, I don't think there's one police officer, whether they're current or in the past, that can look at like the situation that happened with George Floyd and said, that was a good job. It's not. It's embarrassing. It's wrong. And it's frustrating. And it it makes you mad that we have officers that are out there thinking that this is a good way of doing something or not having the skill sets to actually do something the right way. So training is everything. You know, the more you educate people, the more training you give them, the better off they're going to be. But we have people trying to go the other way because when they sit there and they say, defund the police, the dumbest, stupidest idea that you could ever come up with because it will work exactly towards making things worse. And, you know, I'm not the person, you know, and I don't, you're not the person. I don't have to worry about people trying to hurt me. If you want to try, obviously you can try and maybe you'll be successful, but I don't need the police. But a lot of people do. And they need the police. And a lot of these people live in very low income areas and they need the police because there are predators out there that prey upon them. Yeah. And you can't take and take the skill sets away from those police officers because you took money away. You do those things, you're harming innocent people. You're making, you're going to make their lives more difficult because everywhere that I've gone, Marcus, around the world, 99.9% of the people out there are good people. Yeah. There's yeah. always that, you know, small percentage that want to take or do something to ruin or cause problems for the life of that good person. But for the most part, people just want to, I want to have a job. I want to have my family. And I want you to leave me alone. You know, and I think education and a response of police officers must train in this type of system for this many hours every year for them to continue being a police officer with that badge. I completely agree. And from doing a lot of force training with, with, you know, LAPD and Sheriff's Department over here as well, I I completely agree with you. And what a lot of people don't take into consideration, you know, everything is easy with 2020 hindsight and, and, and looking back and go, well, this is what you should do. Yes, if you are doing it not under stress, it's easy to make that decision when you don't have adrenaline pumping. And that's, you know, what a lot of people don't take into consideration that, that you know, this, this is happening under high stress, especially whether uh, rightfully so or not, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, it's just perception. If you feel that you're fighting for your life and then you're try to for your life. You're fighting for your life, whether you are or not, it feels like it, you are fighting for your life. That's right. And Um, and, and, you know, when you have that stress and adrenaline, you know, it's it's the same as a referee, right? When you, when you, when you're inside of the cage, you have a short amount of time to make the right decision. And people don't realize when you have thousands and thousands of people looking at you and screaming, and you know that you are responsible for the fighter's health in there, that there will be stress and adrenaline for you as well. Do you remember what fight you were most nervous to ref? Oh my God. Yeah. The very first one of my life, <laughs> yeah, you know, I was nervous and it's, it's funny. Cause you know, I, I, I tell people all the time, I tell athletic commissioners, you know, athletic commissions, they, you know, they have their people that are in their States or in their areas and, and they, you know, they try to push them. And when the big shows come, 
to their state, they they want to put their guy in that spot. And I, and sometimes these are guys that I've, I've trained and I will tell them, I said, Hey, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't put that person in this show, give them the preliminary fight here by putting them in the spot that you are, you have no concept, the amount of pressure you are placing upon his shoulders or her shoulders, because they, first off, they want to do good. They want people to look and say, Oh, he did a good job. And just standing there before the fight starts, you know, if Herb or I are doing a fight and it's a big fight, you know, as big a fight as you can think of, you know, Conor McGregor versus Aldo or, you know, a, a Conor Nate Diaz or something like that, you know, when, when they're walking out, my heart rate's probably at about 75 beats per minute. It's a little elevated, but, right. you know, nothing much. And that's just because of the energy in the crowd. But if you take a person or Herbs, Herbs would be the same way, but if you take a person that, you know, has never been in that situation, you put a heart rate monitor on them, they're standing still doing nothing and their heart rate's going to be somewhere around 145 to 150 beats per minute because there's adrenaline pumping through them and they know that, oh my God, this is it. I can't make a mistake. And just by being nervous, like they're, they have a good chance of, of making that mistake. And so you learn how to you know, deal with pressure and pressure is something that some fighters deal with beautifully and some fighters don't, you know, and, and we say, you know, pressure either crushes you or it creates a diamond and you learn how to deal with that pressure. But it's, it's a lot different to be in that cage with two fighters and it's for real and the world's watching and you're man, you have no idea how much pressure is there on you. And so it's a, uh, I haven't had that. The one time I will tell you that I got a spark was when Conor McGregor was going to fight uh, Jose Aldo. That was a big fight. Yeah. And Jose Aldo was walking out. And I just felt like this like buzz go through my body. And I went, well, well that's weird. Yeah, but it was kind of cool. I thought, all right, that, it's telling, my, my brain is telling me this is a big one. This is going to be good. And then it was 13 seconds long. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, and, and on that note, you talked about Herb. It was just a little dispute not long ago between Dan Hardy, who's a great guy, and, and Herb. Uh, you, you, first and foremost, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with it, right? Since you're, yeah. You're, yeah. And how, what, what would you say about the situation? You know, the situation is caused in a couple of ways. First off, I want to say I think Dan Hardy is a phenomenal commentator. I think yeah. he's a phenomenal analyst. He knows fighting. Yeah. And he's passionate about fighting, but he does not know refereeing. And when, when I say that, could Dan Hardy officiate a big fight? Yes, if the big fight had no problems. Yes. But when you start to have problems and you, you have situations, you have to have what we call referee mechanics that you fall back on every time. And that's what Herb was doing when he came in on that fight. Uh, Dan made comments of, as far as stop the fight because he cares about the fighter. And I understand that, and that's, that's all good. But it was the interaction, not that. Dan has the right, in my opinion, to criticize Herb. Yeah. The commentator, he's a fan. That's what you get paid for, or that's what you pay money for a ticket. So you can make that criticism. Go ahead. Herb needs to have thick enough skin that he goes, I don't care what you think. I know what I did and I know why I did it. Yeah. It was the, I think the atmosphere of no crowd kind of brought them together. That's where things started to go really wrong. Right, right. If you're Dan, you can't do that. Yeah. You know what? You are a broadcaster here while the tape, while that, you know, fight is going and while things are, you're talking about that fight. You can say what you want. I believe that that was a horrible stoppage. You go ahead and say it. That's okay. That's your right. But when it got outside and then he became face-to-face -face confrontational with her, he overstepped the line. That's not his place because he doesn't truly understand. When This is what people need to understand. It's easy to sit on the outside, and I'm doing it now, and say, stop the fight. Because you could be right, but you can also be wrong. And if you're wrong, there is no result that comes from it. doesn't matter. 
You can say stop the fight. All of a sudden, the fighter's turning, and he's back in the fight, and you go, oh, well, he's still fighting. But if you were the referee and you stopped it, you just affected a fighter's career. So you've got to do those things that I'm saying as far as mechanics to get yourself past. And when you see a guy fall, you know, I always say there's five different ways that someone will fall in what we call a knockdown or a knockout. And Dan was, you know, trying to say that Jai Herbert was out. He wasn't. I can tell you he wasn't. I know he wasn't. And you can, you know, you can take pictures and you can see where his eyes are focused and there's his hands. And sitting. I'm not saying that the, the function between his brain and his body was complete and that it was functioning well. It wasn't. But when he falls backwards, that's a position that you can defend. When we talk about, you know, the human body and a fighter, all of my offense comes facing you. It doesn't come from my back. That's why in MMA, I want to take the back. You can't hurt me, and I can do all kinds of things to you. And so Herb is looking at that, and he has the second element of the opponent stopped. Trinaldo comes up, and he oh, and he just he's standing there over him, hesitant, waiting, like, are you going to stop it? Now Herb's in a position, oh, you're giving him more time. His brain's coming back. I've got to let this go because I can't stop it early. And then Jair, Herbert, comes, why did you stop it? I'm fine. Yeah. Then he's in a bad position. Oh, it's an early stoppage. So it's one of those, you know, sometimes you can't win either way. Yeah. But Herb was well within his right as far as the way he handled that fight. Yeah. I do not think that he should have done what he did afterwards with the video. And he's talking about Dan not by naming him. You know, I thought you, it's too, you shouldn't have done that. I understand why he did it because referees have no way of fighting back and most referees will say nothing herb has established himself for so long that he feels like you know i'm gonna say something i'm tired of this yeah and dan hardy had his response after that and that all of that should not have happened it's all wrong and you just need to move on from the scenario dan hardy can think that it's a bad stoppage herb can think it's a good stoppage let it go yeah as a that's that's a very good point, and we we look at we look at fighters. You can have part of it is black and white, right? If you're out, you're out. If they're fine to fight back, they're fine to fight back. And sometimes it's mistakes you can't see it from the angle. People don't realize that from one side of a cage to another side of the cage, different and that's why judges' results are so different. Sometimes, like it's a different fight. You know, yep. you can have two people standing next to each other in a street scenario and then give their alibi afterwards to the police and it's two completely different stories. And yep. you don't think the same thing's going to happen with, with judges. And, and, but then you do have that gray zone, right? Where you've got some fighters that can just take a beating and come back. Like you've mentioned earlier, Nate Diaz, for example, you're like, I don't want to see more blood, but you know that he, if you stop the fight, he'd be furious. <laughs> and, and, and there's a lot of fighters like that. And, and, and that's that gray zone, right? Where, it's subjective, it's subjective to both the fighter and to the ref. When has the referee seen enough? And when, when has the fighter taken enough? And you're one of the few people that can, that's actually transitioned. And I have two parts to this question. One is, what made you go from, from refereeing to commentating? That's the first part. And then the second part is, what do you enjoy more at this point? <laughs> yeah, I went from uh, refereeing to commentating, honestly, Cause I got hurt, you know, I, uh, I had had a neck injury long ago and I had surgery. I had a couple of discs replaced and everything went well. And they put this cage around my, uh, my, uh, spinal cord and, and our vertebrae to hold those discs in place and everything was good. And I was teaching, I was, uh, teaching, uh, a course and I was teaching, uh, the difference between a Japanese necktie and a Darce choke and, getting people to understand the difference and have them do it so they can see where the pressure is going to be. And I was letting them, I was being the person having it put on. And one of them, I don't know what happened, but I was in it for a while and I got, you know, finally they got the pressure right. And then I get up and I was fine. But the next day I was like, Oh, I got a problem. And it, within two days I started having paralysis. I couldn't lift up my arm. Oh, wow. And then it just kept getting worse. And then I started to atrophy real bad. Well, I went and had s- surgery because they, you know, I crushed a bunch of stuff in there and they s- 
went to fix it, and there's a the, your nerves has got six nerves running through this what's called the thorax, and I had crushed all six of them, and they could free five of them, and so you know they did what they could do, and then it switched to the other side, so I had to have another. So I got cut here, I got cut here, I got cut on the back of my uh, neck. So I, I then, you know, I took some time off, about only about a month, because I always come back usually within a week. But it was, uh, I did the Rose Nama Yunus versus uh, Joanna Janjacek, because that was the, there was going to be that fight, and I did George St. Pierre against Michael Bisping that night. And when I did the Joanna, you know, uh, Rose fight, I did things different because I, I didn't want to run into, into Rose and knock her off of Ioana, and I couldn't. I knew – I used to just grab someone and pick them up and yeah. put them to the side. Yeah. You know, I did it with you know, female fighters all the time because they're lighter weight fighters, and, and with some of the light, lighter weight guys, it was easy, and it, it always took them away from their opponent, and it worked well for me. Right. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do that. So you know, I just stopped, and she stopped. She did everything right. But I knew in the back of my mind, I can't do this anymore. I'm either going to have to figure out a different way of how doing stuff, but I'm not the same. And so, honest to God, one month later, you know, Jimmy Smith decided to go to uh, the UFC to commentate from Bellator. I got a call from Scott Coker saying, hey, would you like to audition for it? And I was like, Maybe, maybe this is a sign. Maybe I should try that. And I said, yeah, I would like to. And I got the job, and that's why I switched. And what were you more nervous for? Refereeing your first UFC fight or first commentating job for Bellator? First commentating job for Bellator. <laughs> Way more nervous. That's funny because, you know, you, I, I watched it, and I, was, I, I didn't really know the story behind it. And I think it's cool. I think you're a great analyst because you've been in the game for so long. You understand it. and. Um, it, it, I, I, but that doesn't mean, like you said, just because you're a good fighter, like, like Dan Hart, it doesn't mean necessarily that you would make a great referee or you understand what it takes because you've never done it, right? And the same thing with, with the commentating. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if, 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 if John's going to be a great guy, but you, you're amazing at commentating and I like Thank it. You. Um, and and, and what, what, as, 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 a, as a commentator, I know it because I've done some, what do you think is the hardest thing about commentating? I think the hardest thing about commentating is talking to people and trying to break down the fight and make it easy. So I, I try to basically, I try to dumb it down. And I know that I shouldn't say that, but I try to talk to my mother. I try to talk to people that really don't follow fighting to get them an idea of, oh, this is what they're doing and this is how it's going to finish. And this is what they need to do to defend against it. I really try to just think about, I'm not talking to the guys that are in jujitsu class. I'm not talking to the guys, you know, that are fighters and stuff. I'm talking to the people that, Hey, they just turned on the TV or they're sitting with their, their boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, whatever. And now trying to figure out what are those people in that cage doing? I want to talk to them and get them that idea of what's really going on in the fight. That's a really way, a good way of, of looking at it. I didn't even think about it that way. That's amazing. Um, I, have, I have some great questions for some people. Um, first, uh, first question I have for you here is, what's the biggest mismatch you have ever refed? Do you remember the names, what fight it was? And, uh, and I'm sure you've seen several over the years, but the biggest, oh, like, big stage mismatch. Oh, man, I've had so many big mismatches. <laughs> um, you know, you could go back all the way. There was two, if you want to talk about, you know, all the way in the past. I'll give you ones in the past, and I'll give you something in the present. You could go back, and there was Don Fry came out at UFC 8, and he fought this guy named, I think it was Thomas, uh, and what was Thomas's? Thomas Ramirez. And this guy was a taxi cab driver. He had no business being in there, because Don Fry was a true wrestler out of, you know, Arizona State, well, Oklahoma State and then Arizona State because he switched and, you know, had competed in Golden Gloves boxing and stuff and yeah. had been training with, you know, Dan Severn. So you look at that, you go, oh, my God, that was horrible. And then after him was Mark Coleman fought a guy named Sanchez in UFC 11 that had no business being there at all. And you look, you go, oh, this is horrible. But, you know, later on, later on in my career, I got – people need to understand there's times when – promotions 
promoters. They need someone because this guy sells tickets. Yeah. He, he brings men, puts butts in the seats, and then his fight falls apart. And so he tries to re- reestablish that fight, and he gets someone, and then that guy falls out too. And he's now last minute, and he can only find someone that you know, oh, my God, this guy has no chance. And I would get a call from the athletic commission saying, hey, we've got this fight. We need you to referee it. We know it's bad. And I would have to sit there and say, no problem. I'll take care. I'll take care of it. And so, you know, you would get those. I'd get those quite often. But, you know, I felt like I was good enough at saying, all right, this is the time I'm going to stop it and figuring out my spots and not letting someone get really hurt. Now, you can't do anything about it. If you can sit with the one big shot, those are the ones that you're looking to say, well, I'll stop it fast, but he's not going to get another one but you always worry about that one big shot. And that, that kind of happened if you're looking at, you know, California just had the boxing where they had a fighter who was 5-0, and oh, five knockouts going against. Uh, what's see, it? A, yeah, did you see it? I've actually trained with her. She just came, she came here to systems to spell with some of our female. Oh, she's good. She is legit. Yeah, she's legit. And, her, you know, her opponent had those five fights, five knockouts. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, the athletic commission they say, well, because there's what we have, a, you know, there's a BSI index, which yeah. is the scoring in, that gives, you know, where that person's at. And it, it goes anywhere from a minus one, which means you're world champion. You're world, you're the top of the food chain. And it'll go from minus one to zero to plus one, all the way to six. Okay. And so you look at those numbers and you say, I can't make that. Well, you had a person who was minus one, who you're training with and a person who was at zero. So you look and you go, yeah, you know, I look at the fight and I go, I, I don't think she's going to win. I'm, I'm looking at this monster here, but I can make that fight. And, you know, and she got knocked out in like seven seconds and people are all up in arms and you go, yeah, well, you knew it was going to not go well for that person anyways. And so mismatches can happen. They happen a lot more in boxing yeah. than they do in MMA based upon trying to build records. You see that a lot in yeah. boxing. Not so much. You know, you're not a prospect until you're 15 and 0 in, in boxing, right? And yeah. there's only so much you can do with two hands. Whereas, even if you are fighting someone who's a better boxer, you can maybe take them down. Maybe your jiu-jitsu is better, or vice versa. So, yeah. so many more things that can happen. But yeah, that was that was a big mismatch. Here's an interesting question: Who's the dirtiest fight you've ever had to deal with? The I don't dirtiest? even know if you want to answer that, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I want to. I'll give you a for instance, and it's not. I work with Chael Sonnen, and, and Chael, when you, when you sit there and you say, you know, dirty fighter, he's not. Yeah, no. He's clean, no. He's clean but he will ride that edge of that fence as far as he can push it. He'll be grinding with his head. He'll do all kinds of things. And, and guys he's fighting are like, hey, 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 hey. And you're like, it's legal. Just keep going. You know? And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I would say, you know, if I was going to say dirty, Matt Lillen. Okay, Matt Lindland was he's one of one of those guys, he's just a junkyard dog. He will do anything to win the fight. He will he will he cover himself in onion juice and stink. He'll he's just horrible, but he's a good guy. <laughs> I, I like that answer because I've heard that too about just the smell Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, what was the hardest fight for you to ever oversee? As far as I guess the, the damage done and letting it continue. Yeah, I, I would I would say one of the one of the most di- more difficult fights is a fight that everyone loved, and that would have been Robbie Lawler against Rory McDonald oh. number two. It was at yeah. UFC 189. Yeah, you, know, you look at that fight, and people had no idea how badly damaged Rory was early in that fight, and was still just you know coming after Robbie. But, you know, he was aspirating blood throughout that fight, meaning because his nose got damaged early in the fight. Yeah. And he was, you could see him as he couldn't breathe out of his nose. And so he's, and he's, every time he's, you little droplets because he's getting cuts inside of his mouth. They're starting to flow into his lungs and you can see him starting to do well at the beginning of the round and then fall off towards the end because his body is giving out based upon the lack of oxygen there's a lot that was going on in that fight that most people didn't see, but that was a, that was a a fight that it took a lot to, to 
referee and officiate that well, even though you don't see it in it. And it was such a good fight. You yeah. definitely don't notice it. So it, it was, it was a fantastic fight. Yeah. It's funny. Cause everyone remember looking at Robbie's lip, right? Yeah. It's no big deal. No. <laughs> and then I remember, yeah. Rory's is so funny because he's such a quiet, nice guy. And then to understand people, it's, just to understand the amount of pain that he must have been in throughout 25 minutes, basically, right? Or 22 minutes, maybe in, and continue to take punches on that nose that was already broken. Oh yeah. Not only you take a look at the amount of, you know, trauma and the hematomas that he had and everything, you know, people are looking, they do look at Robbie with, you know, the cut on the lip and he had about a three inch gash yeah, yeah, yeah. elbow on top of his head and everyone's like oh my god he's a mess and it's like he's nothing <laughs> this guy here is my problem you know and it was just a hell of a fight between two great guys yeah um an interesting question which i unfortunately again it's getting better but the 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 your thoughts on the 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 i'm quoting here the piss poor scoring judging of mma or this the system uh so the 10 10-9, the boxing rules really was where, where it came from, right? What's your thought of the 10-9, 10-8 system for mixed martial arts? I think we've come to a point where we realize, you know, people need to understand why that was put in place. Yeah. You know, and you had athletic commissions and they don't know of any other way of doing it. And this is fighting and they're looking saying, well, did we do it this way in boxing? It'll work for us in, in MMA. But if you look at just the mathematics of it, you know, the fact that, you know, if you're looking at an average fight in MMA is three rounds. Well, an right. average fight in boxing is usually at least twice that because the, the least you'll get is four rounds. Yeah. You get six rounds, eight rounds, 10 rounds, 12 rounds. So the, the fact that we have three, it's taking how much those points matter and intensifying them. Yeah. You, know, you get into a five round fight, you're looking at, that five rounds, those points, when it's, especially when it's a close round, can make a huge difference because now I have a close round, close round, and then I have a dominant round. Now if I'm going to give an eight to one of the fighters, boy, now he's really got to do something big either by finishing the fight or coming back huge in the next couple of rounds to try to get you know, even a draw in this thing. Yeah, It's a difficult situation. The 10-8, you know, 10-9 system that we use – is not well matched for MMA and it, it does need to change. I personally believe there's other systems that we could start working and putting in place because we're not doing our judges any favors. We're putting our judges in yeah. a horrible position before the fight ever starts. Yeah. You know, because the criteria that they go by is it's good, but yeah. the score yeah. that the score that they're going to give is sometimes you're looking and you're going, you know, the UFC just had a fight, uh, just happened. I think it was from the Apex Center, but it was um, a kid named Gutierrez fighting a kid named Durden. It was the first fight on the preliminaries. Oh, and Durden is a wrestler, and he comes out and he gets the back, and he does everything, you know, that we're asking someone to try to do to get that eight because at certain times he's going for submissions. He's taking and he's, he bellies him down, and, you know, he's – trying to hit him with big, heavy shots to get him out of the fight, it's a 10-8 round. I would have scored a 10-8 round, and every judge there scored it a 10-8 round. And then Gutierrez comes back in the second round, and he wins the second round. And by the third round, he's putting it on Durden, and Durden is surviving in the fight. But we end up with a draw when we didn't have an even fight. I had I one fighter I that was – was he was actually better in this fight if anyone you know you could ask any of those judges all right pick somebody who should win this they would all pick the terrence yeah so if the scoring system doesn't allow that to show we've got a problem and we've got to do something to make it to where the it whoever wins the fight should actually win on the scorecards and, and right. japan had that right like pride had that in the early days where there was like the ultimately the, the referee, would you, and again, now it becomes a little bit more subjective and, and so on. What, what would be your ultimate dream scenario for, for, for a judging system? 
Well, you know, people talk about the old pride days, but they forget a lot. <laughs> they forget exactly, you know, pride had a lot of really bad decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and they had some, you know, where you look and you go, well, this is your, your rules. And so this guy, he, you know, yeah, he lost all that time, but he was winning at the, at the very end. But so he won two minutes of the fight and lost 15 minutes of it. And you're giving it, okay, I understand, you know, but, there's no perfect, but we, I do believe you've got to structure and break it down. If you took, you know, we talked about half points before. Yeah. And the difference with half points is at least you're giving the judge the ability to differentiate the difference between a very close round would be like that 9.5. And right. okay, this is, it's, this is, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, uh, so close, it's clear this guy wins. That's a 10-9. And then, well, you know what? This guy wins in a wide margin, but not enough for me to give him the 8. Now we can go to the 8.5. Well, there's three scores right there that all fit within what we have as one score right now with 9. Yeah. So yeah. it would open things up for the judges to be fairer to the fighters as far as what they actually did and what they actually deserve. So – Instead of being caught in this middle of, do I give a nine or do, do I give an eight? I'm going to give the nine because he didn't quite reach what I needed for the eight. Well, that's a good, you know, that's good, for, good on you. But now the next round is super close and we have an even fight on the cards, but we haven't had an even fight in the cage. Yeah. And that becomes the problem with the scoring system that we have right now. It is difficult. And I, I see I'm watching the jurors and dirt and I was thinking the same thing, you know, and, and, and the problem with, with MMA is, well, there's so much to, to judge. There's so much criteria to look at. Do you want to count those takedowns? You didn't do any damage with it. You know, yeah, you controlled them on, you were on top of them, but you didn't do anything or you dropped someone, which in boxing would be a 10, eight round because you yep. dropped them. But, but was it really enough? Like, what did you follow up? What happened afterwards? It's it's really really hard. I don't I don't envy MMA oh. judges, and it's an ungrateful job. I always say being police officer is the most ungrateful job on the planet. Being an MMA ju judge, even Number though two. Not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's it's a it's a difficult job, and um, you know it's it's easy to sit on the sidelines and go you know and and you will always have opinions right because everyone's biased you always have whoever you like sure. the most and you see what they do and you forget what the other person did um so as a it's, it's funny because i was sitting last night with my wife and, and i was like i was i was telling her i was really excited about today and i said i've never had so many questions for anyone and and i jokingly said to her i said do you have any questions for john she goes yeah and she said Ooh. She said, is there any decision that he's ever made that he regrets? I'm like, that's a really good question for someone who's not really an MMA fan. Of so course. That's the question. No, it's a, you know, it's a good question. And of, of course, you know, the, I tell everybody that I ever work with or train, the one thing that I expect out of every MMA official, be it referee or judge, is be honest. Yeah. You're human you can make a mistake. If you write something down on that card that afterwards you go back and you look and you go, I didn't see that that way. I, I was wrong. Say I was wrong. Okay. Yeah. okay. And figure out what it was that you didn't see. Maybe it was the angle that you were sitting at. If you're the referee, you're going to make mistakes. The sport is too fast. Yeah. But the thing that I cannot have you do is make an excuse for your mistake. Okay, that doesn't sit. If you make the mistake, figure out, okay, how did I make the mistake? What can I do so that won't happen again? What's the better way of handling this situation? And now I've got to move on. I got to let it go. Yeah. And you got to be honest about it. And of course, I mean, you know, I get the funny part for me is I'll get people say, oh, he really screwed up this fight or he did that, you know, and it's 22 years ago. <laughs> you know, when I was, when I had like 50 fights under my belt, because that was, you know, the only thing going was the UFC. So everyone saw those fights. And if I did something, you know, Hey, at least I was honest about it. You know, I had one with um, Conan Silvera fought uh, Sakuraba in Japan. And it was you know, right around UFC 15. And I probably had done a total professional wise, 70 fights in my life, you know, and I was told by the owner at the time, Hey, you need to protect this guy. 
we can't have him get hurt because he was a last minute replacement. And no one knew that Sakuraba was going to end up being one of the all time greats in MMA because he was a professional wrestler. Yeah. And so, you know, he told me, he says, you know, when you can get him out, get him out of there. And I made a mistake. I thought he got hit with a shot. He was actually dropping. It was a bad level change, but you know, it wasn't that he got hurt and I stopped the fight and I went and I looked at tape and we didn't have tape replay back then, but I looked at it and I go, I made a mistake. You need, you need to let him, you know, don't count that as a loss. And, you know, we got to get him back in the fight. And they actually put him back in, which really wasn't fair to Conan because he, he had a big adrenaline dump. He knew how good the guy was. So, you know, it didn't work out fair for everyone. But if you're going to be in this position, you have to be honest. And when you make a mistake, you got to try to make that mistake right. Sometimes you can do it. Sometimes you can't. Yeah, and, and exactly what you said, whether you're an MMA referee, if you're a police officer, if you're an accountant, you're going to make mistakes, right? It's, like you said, it's being human and how do we grow from it? How do we, um, and, and, and what you just mentioned as well is something that we've seen in, in some sports and it's working so well. I can't believe that all sports haven't implemented it, which is instant replay where I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm out on a, on a stretch where I don't know. I think in American football, I'm not a big American. Oh, yeah. Fan. In football, American football, they haven't, right? Yeah. They just implemented it in, in the World Cup in soccer. Why would, why would you not do that? Like you just said, it's, it's, it's so fast and it's so easy for ice. It's a blink at times. And whether it's a, a foul or if it's something else, why would you not implement that in fighting? Well, they, they have. It's part of the unified rules is we do have a system for instant replay. The big difference is this. And there's, there's one place, Nevada, is different than the unified rules in their use of instant replay. But okay. in the unified rules, to use instant replay, it has to be that it was you were questioning whether there was a foul and, w and that foul was part of a fight-ending sequence. Okay. Meaning that if I go to instant replay, this fight is over. I can't restart it. It is going to be over. That's the only way I can go to instant replay. Really? Nevada. Go ahead, what? It, no, I was just saying, really, is that the only way? Wouldn't it be possible to like, have a screen real close by and call a timeout and go, it wouldn't work? I'm okay. That's, that's, you can do that in Nevada. Nevada says that oh. now you can utilize instant replay at any time during the fight. But that can be a problem too. Because oh. we'll say that you and I are fighting. And I okay. land. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as we're fighting, you go and you, you throw a front kick and it actually lands right in my solar plexus. Right. right? And hurts, and I go, oh, and act like I've been hit with a groin shot. Right. And the referee goes, stop time, and stops you from attacking me now that you've hurt me. Right. And then puts you to a corner and puts me to a corner, goes to the instant replay to, to look at it, and sees that that didn't hit him in the groin. That, that was a legal shot. So now, what did he do to you? Prevent me he, took from away, fight. he took away your ability to possibly finish the fight. He took away a big advantage that can never be given back. Yeah. And so the use of it can be detrimental to yeah. a fighter. It's not fair because, and that's what makes fighting different is you're always working at, if you're the official, what is fair to both fighters? Yeah. And yeah. I've got to try to be fair to both fighters. And so, that's where, you know, it can be a problem because now, yeah, maybe he can sit there and I can say, oh, well, I'm telling you, it, I felt it, you know, it hurt, it hurt my groin. And he goes, no, it hit you in the stomach. I, I, no, I'm telling you, this is where I felt. He goes, well, I'm going to take a point. Okay, you take a point. You still had that fight ending sequence taken away from you. It can never be given back. So, again, there's no perfect. But the use of instant replay is being – it is allowed within MMA. It's just under – in most places, it's under certain circumstances. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so – a lot of sports, right, where it's so open to interpretation, subjectivity, and so on, which makes it very, very difficult. And you can only do what you can 
what you can do, right, to make it. And, and that's why I, I'm excited. I'm from, from my own curiosity. I, I enjoy asking these questions because what is the – no one is going to be able to answer better than someone who's been inside of that cage for 25 years. What do you think works the best? And, and um, it's interesting to, to hear that even you can't say there is a perfect system, right? There's nothing that would make it completely perfect. There's not, you know, in fact, you know, the guy, one of the guys I work with, Josh Thompson. Yes. You know, his last professional fight, I refereed. And it was against uh, Patricky Pitbull, who's from Bellator, from, you know, fights out of Brazil. Big, big time puncher, you know, really good lightweight fighter. And there was a, you know, when we talk about referees, we talk about mechanics, we talk about positioning. And it's knowing where to move in the fight so you can see the things. Because, we have things that we call open and closed sides on fighters. You know, if you get a guy that's a southpaw and he's facing this way and you get a guy that's a, you know, standard sense, you're seeing the open sides from where you're at, but I'm seeing the close side. So when a kick comes this way, I can't see where it lands. Where if I'm on your side, I can. Right. So right. the referee, that's why the referee is always trying to move and being in that, what we call the right position mechanics wise. And there's, there's times when mechanics wise, you're doing everything right, but, the blow happens on the opposite side and you're not going to see it. And that happened with, uh, with Josh. They came together. And I, when I, they came together, I saw both guys throwing and I saw Patricky throwing a left hook and I see Josh go down. But I, in the back of my mind, I was like, well, did, the, did the hook hit or did their heads clash? I couldn't tell. Yeah. Based upon where I was at. And then Josh pops up right away and Patricky goes after him and hits him and hurts him and I stopped the fight. And it, I went to the judge. This is what we call polling the judges. And I went to the judge that was closest, that had the angle to see that. And I said, hey, did you see? Was that a left hand that hit him or did their heads clash? And he goes, no, it was a left hand. I said, okay, great. Because that, I didn't miss something that's good. And then I watched it on replay. And sure enough, I can see it's their heads clashed. Ah. You know, it wasn't the left hand. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, you're in that position. You can try to do everything right. And you can't make it right based upon what happens. It's, it's just the sport. That's why when they say protect yourself at all times, because there's times when the referee is not going to be able to protect you, even when he possibly should. You know, even as, as, as a fan watching the sport, right, we just had Till Whitaker too, and I, I, I watched that, and, and it was an elbow from Till that, that dropped Whitaker, right? I thought it was a headbutt. And I'm yep. watching it on, you know, high definition TV, and I thought it was a headbutt, you know. And not until the replay between the rounds did I see that it was the elbow. So, yeah, it's a, it's difficult. It's so difficult. It's even difficult, you know, cornering. You know, sometimes uh, my own fight will come back, and I don't know what happened. You know, did were you rocked? Were you not rocked? Was it? Did it look like you were rocked? Were you trying to? Were you playing a game? Were you trying to You're get trying to play? Yeah, and and it's so difficult, and and. Uh, it's, it's it, uh, talking about, by the way, Josh, who, who's got the worst nickname ever for a fighter as far as the punk, because he's the nicest guy in the world. Why, why did he even get that nickname? Because he's not a punk. He's the opposite of a punk. No, he is a punk. See, he likes to create situations between two people. He calls it hooking. He'll say, hey, you know, you know this guy said this about you. Hey, you know, this guy said this about you. Hey, man, I would have let, let him talk to me that way. Hey, what are you doing? Here? And it's like, you're a punk. <laughs> 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 so you guys have your own you have a podcast which by the way greatest name ever weighing in you know it's it's spelled weighing in like a weigh in but weighing in yes it's uh, uh it's uh it's a it's a great what do you two talk about on the podcast you know we talk i know i'm not ask. i've listened yeah. to you guys are great but for we the talk, people that don't know we talk about mma you know we talk about all levels of mma we're not just about one promotion we're about MMA as a sport, what's going on with it. We'd give, you know, we have a lot of insight because we've both been there. And, you know, a lot of fans, are, they're going to have their, their, you know, their favorite promotion, and that's great, no problem with that. And then they're going to like certain people that we say, you know what, he's not doing the right thing here. You know, but what we're saying is based upon facts, facts sometimes that the fans don't know. But, you know, we're going to give you a, a good, you know, reason for why we're talking about something with the sport. We talk about fights. We talk about matchups before they happen, after they happen. You know, what occurred 
if you like the sport or enjoy the sport of MMA, you'll like the podcast. And you got the Bellator card for tomorrow. Yep. And uh, is there any specific fight that you're excited to see on there? You know, there's actually a couple of there's there's you know a couple that are in the preliminaries that I'm looking forward to. There's a fight between you know AJ Agazarm, who's really well known grappler. Yeah. Very right. good Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. And he look, he's good. He was a wrestler at, you know, Ohio State. Very good, you know, BJJ has been very successful. Fighting a kid named Chris Lencioni, who is uh, from the Oregon area. Very talented fighter. Very good on the ground. Good, good on his feet. They've been having a lot of words back and forth. And it's, it's going to be, a, you know, a fun fight because, you know, Lencioni's good on the ground, but he's not as good as Agazarm. And Agazarm is getting better on his feet, but he's not as good as Lencioni. So it's going to match up really well. We'll see who gets to put the fight where they want it. But you could take a look at the uh, the main card has got a couple of fights on it that are going to be really good. You know, the, obviously the main event is Benson Henderson and Mike Chandler. And look, they're both top of the food chain in the sport of MMA in the lightweight division. Benson is, you look at you know, the guy, he's remarkable if you, if you think about what he's accomplished. He was the WEC champion, the UFC champion. Came to Bellator and had a lot of problems, you know, got, you know, a lot of losses. Yeah. But he's come back, he's built himself back up. And here's a guy, man, he never marks up in a fight. You know, we talk about fighters that, you know, they don't mark. I've seen Benson come out of fights where I know he got whooped. He doesn't have a mark on it. You know, and I know he took big shots. I don't know how he does it. You know, the only thing that gets messed up on Benson is his hair. You know, yeah. but, you know, he's already had yeah, this fight. I'm, I'm I'm really excited to see it as well. I'm really excited. I love Chandler and his work ethics and uh, yep. both of them. I don't think I've seen either one of them in a boring fight ever. That's the whole thing is, you know, Chandler comes out so fast and he's so athletic and he's got, you know, he's got really good wrestling. His right hand is got power. He's got a good left hook. He's, you know, he's very fast can't be submitted. I've seen guys get good submissions on him and have it deep and he still gets out. He's never been submitted in his career. So this is, I think this fight comes down to round one. I think both guys are going to come out, you know, Benson is notoriously a slow starter and he yeah. cannot be a slow starter in this fight against uh, Chandler. He's got to come out blazing and going after him. And if he does that, he's got a chance of winning the fight. If, if, Chandler can stop him from doing that. I think Chandler is going to win the fight, but I do think it's going to go the distance. And I think it's one that'll go the, the three rounds, but it should be a barn burner from beginning to end. I look forward to seeing that fight as well. And we usually end by, by asking our guests for, for, for some homework, a daily tip or something that they can recommend our listeners to do. What do you have for them, John? Uh, you know, my tip would be this, you know, no matter what it is that you do, no matter what it is you want to do or you like, you want to be part of, it, it all takes, you know, certain things to start taking place for those things to happen. And we all dream of things, uh, but a dream is just a dream. And so if you have that dream of doing something, I want you to take that dream and I want you to write it down. Because now when you write it down, it becomes a goal. And then I want you to figure out once you've written it down and now it's become a goal, What's my first step in this journey to making that goal happen? And if you work at it, if you take forward steps and you never take no for an answer, even when you get knocked down, you get back up, the door gets closed, you figure another way to open it. If you do that, you have that mentality, whatever that dream is will become a reality. That's very, very true. What gets measured, get, what gets managed, get measured. What gets measured, get done, right? Bingo. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a great one. And for you that don't know, John is also uh, an author. Um, you wrote Let's Get It On, which is, the, of course, the name of your book, The, the Making of MMA, and it's Ultimate Referee. Um, it, it's, it's the story of this. I have one last question for you as well, just about sure. this longest career because you have you have a longer career than any fighter because you've been in there with with all of them what's your craziest moment in mixed martial arts as far as not the the fight inside the cage but just the craziest moment that you've experienced i mean 
I, I've had some crazy ones in, in some crazy places as far as fans jumping in and things like that. But I would say the one that most people, you know, I don't know if they'd say it was a crazy moment, but it's a, it was a crazy situation was yeah. uh, I had Tim, Tim Kennedy against Yoel Romero. And in between the second, third round, they call it, you know, Joe Rogan called it Stoolgate. Well, there's a lot going on. But, uh, you know, that was caused by a, a cut man doing certain things and trying to fix it and stuff. And that was a situation you, I, you talk about. I looked at it afterwards, and I, and I knew that I was right in not taking points from Yoel because it wasn't Yoel's fault. He didn't right. do it. It wasn't his corner's fault. It was a person from the promotion that created the problem. And I couldn't, I couldn't penalize him for just because that's the person that was given to him in the corner. But uh, I, I should have figured out a way to make it fair for both. Because like I said before, you know, you're trying to balance that what's fair for both. And in making it fair for UL, I'm not really making it fair for Tim. And, you know, after time and everything, if I had the situation, I would know exactly what to do now because I looked at it and said, I didn't handle that as, you know, the way it could have been handled. How do you, how do you fix it? How do you make it better? Figure it out a way. And then I retired. So don't have to do it. I can just teach it to other guys now. <laughs> Well, John, thank you for your time. People that are watching this, please make sure you tune in to Weighing In as well with Josh Thompson and Big John. And look forward to listening to you tomorrow and watching Bellator as well. Thank you for taking the time, John. Hey, thanks for having me, Marcus. It's good talking to you, brother. Likewise.